I'm making something new, at least something new for me, out of a very good vegetarian cookbook that I have, a roasted tomato sauce. Uh, I'll go through the ingredients and explain the process to you, but while I'm talking about the ingredients, I'll also explain what I've used that's a bit different than what they're calling for. It calls for four pounds of ripe tomatoes. It says that's 12 to 16 medium tomatoes. Well, I only grew the cherry tomatoes and the yellow pear, so I use those instead, and it calls for peeling the larger tomatoes. You you know, you blanch them in boiling water for a minute, and, and then the peeling comes off quite easily. But I could not be bothered to do that with that many cherry tomatoes or yellow pears, so they are in their hole. I'll have skins and all, which won't make the sauce quite as fancy, I guess. It calls for a pound of sweet onions. Rather than use my onions, which are now hardened off quite nicely and will store for hopefully quite a long period of time. I used my shallots. Uh, they're starting already to get soft. Shallots don't uh, store that well, so I use shallots instead of onions. Five cloves of, of garlic, and mine are five large cloves of garlic because of the variety that I use. I use the northern Quebec, which has four cloves to the head, and that's a slice of one of them there. Um, I don't know, I guess it's not quite as strong as some garlic, so. Two tablespoons of olive oil. Uh, I didn't measure, I just used some olive oil. Along with the onions and garlic, I used two of my medium-sized hot cayenne peppers. Uh, put them in the food processors at the same time that I was uh, chopping up the, the uh, shallots. That isn't in the recipe at all. That's just for my personal taste, I guess. A teaspoon of salt. I didn't really measure. I just seasoned with salt. And three tablespoons of a fresh chopped basil. And uh, that was just about the end of the basil in the greenhouse. We haven't had frost yet. I'm, this particular clip, hard to say when it'll actually get on YouTube, but this is, this is the 20th of uh, September. We still haven't had our first frost, but it's been getting down to four or five degrees at night, and the basil in the hoop house is wilting. It isn't, isn't killed by frost, but basil does not like cold temperatures, so that's about the last of the basil. This goes in the 375 degree oven for two and a half hours. The first hour, you just leave it in the oven. It goes on a cookie sheet or a baking tray that has a lip, so liquids won't run all over the oven. After the first hour, you uh, stir it once every half hour until it's finished, to the full two and a half hours. So I will show you what the finished product looks like. Well, I had an idea when I was cooking this, um, a way to remove the skins from the finished product. Whoops, doesn't quite fit this bowl. I'm going to use my uh, French food mill here. That's about half of the finished roasted tomatoes and I only ended up doing it for two hours. One hour without turning it, stirring it, and then I stirred it twice. At the end of the second hour um, at least the tomatoes that I'm using I thought were dry enough. Another half hour I thought they might have been a bit a bit overdone. So I will come back and show you what I get here after I have put it through the French food mill. Well it certainly made a nice rich thick sauce. Uh, passing it through the food meal did a good job, removed all of the skins plus pureed any of the garlic and shallots and whatever that were still in solid pieces. Mine is more an orange color than than red and that's of course is because I used more than half of the tomatoes were those yellow pear tomatoes. Mm. And roasting it really concentrates the the flavor and the sweetness of the tomatoes. It's very good. 
in this cookbook that uh, the basic part of this recipe came from. It's called the, the New Vegetarian um, Epicure by Anna Thomas. A lot of excellent recipes in there. She suggests using it with polenta, so that's what I'm going to have it with this evening with dinner is some polenta. It would also be excellent with pasta, but I'll probably show you what it looks like with polenta and maybe even some grilled eggplant. No, I do not eat most of my meals here at the kitchen counter. <laughs> I'm much more sophisticated than that. I eat most of my meals with the plate balanced on my lap in front of the television. Trying to see what this is like. Mm, I like that. It's a nice sauce, and the polenta has cheese, and uh, I did it in a, um, a vegetable broth, and of course it's also got one of my uh, hot cayenne chilies diced up in it, so everything here is quite spicy. Well, that sauce is well worth making. I hope to give it a try. Well, I'm running out of potatoes at the house again, and I have nine bags left to empty, so I thought today I would do, I think these are Yukon Gold. I have uh, three or four bags of Kara, and the rest are some of those seeds that I, seed potatoes that I got in that special order in the spring. I haven't been doing too great, but... This is looking a little bit better, a little more promising. I like Yukon Gold. It's been quite a few years since I've grown them. seed potato. Well, not much, but if I open another bag of them, I guess I'll have enough for to last me for a day or two. I just remember which number. Oh size of that worm. <laughs> I probably haven't got you completely in focus here, have I? Because I think I focused the camera on the other end here. Nothing quite like a Brendan potato reveal, but the reveals that I've had this summer out of those uh, little strange collection of seed potatoes that I got fairly late, didn't get a chance to start them early to chip them or anything, but probably doing better than some of the other varieties. The Siglinda ones were quite disappointing. I think I still have one bag of the Russian Blues to open too. Not a bad potato, it's a, a dry sort of a potato, tastes fine. We're over in the perennial area here, the sheet mulched area. And this is one of the uh, sun chokes, Jerusalem artichoke, that I planted from seed. And the wind is trying to blow that away so you can't see it. I've been wondering whether or not they would bloom first year from seed. And they haven't bloomed yet, but they've all got blossom buds. And these things are quite cold hardy, so some early frosts won't bother them. I'm thinking I will probably get some blooms a bit later on. Which means that I'm going to dig some of them eventually. Late October, early November. Let's see what I have down below for sun jokes. 
Well, sort of in the center of the screen is my goji berry. It had been devastated by some sort of insect or whatever. All the leaves were eaten, but it grew more leaves. And sort of at the bottom center of the screen there, this bit of it here came up from the, from the root and is much stronger than the original plant. So hopes of that making it through the winter. The other one, which is over closer to the uh, Jerusalem artichokes, it also leaved back out, uh, not as strongly as this one did. I think it's shaded by the artichokes. Plus, I either read or listened to somebody's video or something. Evidently, Jerusalem artichokes produce an, uh, some sort of a herbicide, a natural herbicide, that uh, discourages other plants to grow in their vicinity. So, if that's true, if this one over that's closer there makes it through to spring, I won't transplant it now because anything I ever transplanted this time of year gets shoved right out of the ground here with the frosts thawing and refreezing again in our winters. So, in the spring, I will dig that up and move it further away from the Jerusalem artichokes. Next to it here, I can get this one around or not. There we go. That's the good King Henry. And I'm just about to pick my first good King Henry's. I haven't uh, eaten it other than to eat it raw. So I want to cook a bit of it, see what I think of it, I guess. Be careful not to cut off those blossom spikes. It was never much of a blossom, but like you can see that one or not. That has got little yellow fuzzy blossoms. And ones like that one there, I'm not sure. I think it's finished blooming. I just can't tell if those are seed pods or what. But anyway, I'm going to uh, leave those in theory that maybe it will drop seeds in the area and increase the size of my patch of Good King Henry next year. And according to the book uh, Paradise Lot, the book has got me started on doing a lot of these sort of things, early in the spring the shoots that Good King Henry sends up, this is my first year for growing it, I've never seen the spring shoots to see what they look like, but supposedly they have a taste similar to asparagus. So Looking forward to trying that, assuming it makes it through the winter. Well, you don't need to see me clipping away here. I'm just going to get a handful or so of it, and then I'll up to the house and uh, see what it tastes like. That's fresh out of the frying pan, I guess. All I did was uh, sort of uh, dice it up a bit, chop it up a bit into a sort of a coarse julienne. And then I sautéed it in olive oil with some salt and pepper. I didn't want to add anything else to mask the flavor like I don't know I guess if I was doing it normally or ordinarily I probably would have had garlic or onion or chilies or something else in with it but I just wanted to see what Good King Henry tastes like I don't know quite what I would compare that to Definitely has the flavor of a lot of different greens. It's still a bit on the chewy side. Maybe if I had steamed it, it wouldn't have been. Or maybe it's because these leaves are very mature. If I'd have been picking leaves all summer, it would have been newer leaves that I was taking. It has a little bit of a bitter aftertaste. But I like it. Hope the patch gets bigger next year. Be nice to have a perennial green. Well, thank you very much for watching. I guess that probably concludes this little video.